Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcowski. I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and the director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It is really a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx and Latin American communities across the America. Today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space. Fernanda Rosa is an assistant professor of science, technology, and society at Virginia Tech. Mariana Sanchez, a doctoral student at American University and an affiliate at the Center for Latinx Digital Media, will introduce Mariana in just a minute. I am delighted to note that this quarter, our series is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Center for Global Culture and Communication, the Department of Radio, Television, and Film, the Latina and Latino Studies Program, and the Program in Latin America and Caribbean Studies. But before we go into the seminar, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Orawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. It, is also a, it was also a site of trade, travel, and gathering, and healing for more than a dozen Native American tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about Native peoples and institutions' history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me say briefly about how the seminar will unfold. First, Mariana will tell us more about Fernanda's research and career in just a minute. Then Fernanda will deliver her seminar. After that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar at the bottom of the screen at any point in time. Mariana will moderate. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Mariana, the screen is all yours. Thank you so much, Professor Pablo. Well, it is my honor uh, to introduce Professor uh, Fernanda Rosa. She is currently assistant professor in the Department of Science, Technology, and Society at Virginia Tech. Before she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Advanced Research in Global Communication from the University of Pennsylvania. Her current research builds a bridge between technical discussions on internet interconnection infrastructure and social justice to discuss internet governance and design from the standpoint of the global south. Using an original method defined as code ethnography and transdisciplinary lens founded on science and technology studies, decolonial and feminist studies. Her field work has been developed in Brazil, Mexico, Setsal and Zapoteco sovereign territories and Germany and, the Europe, and as the European counterpoint. Dr. Rosa holds a PhD in communication from American University here in Washington, D.C., a master's in management and public policy from Fundación Getulio Vargas, and a BA in social sciences from the University of Sao Paulo. Welcome, Fernanda. Thank you so much, Mariana. Thank you, Paolo, for this introduction. I'm really honored to be here. I'm talking from Virginia Tech, uh, that is the land of Tutelo and Monacan people. And I hope we have a very good time together today. Um, I will share my screen here. So uh, it's my pleasure to talk about code ethnography here uh, in this room, in this setting, because it's really, it's really a method that is rooted in Latin America. It emerged as a necessity when I was studying internet uh, infrastructure from Latin America with these global south lenses. So I would like to today 
uh, to focus on two things. One is to discuss the mechanics of an ethnography of code. What is true uh, studying code? Uh, but I do that uh, uh, looking at internet interconnection infrastructure. And then another goal I have is that uh, you all understand a little bit more about what is internet interconnection uh, actually. So an important, uh, an important element that we should uh, look at is that uh, the study of materialities of communication uh, is here for a while. And I think we can see through this to these books that it's kind of established, if we can say like that. Um, it started, uh, at least in the US, I think that a seminal work that uh, marks this moment is the work of Alexander Galloway in 2006. The Materialities of Communication is a translation from German. Uh, and also then we, we start seeing more and more works try to bring uh, what is behind, what is the infrastructure behind communication. I think uh, my work is fundamentally uh, uh, rooted in the internet governance scholarship that is also emerging in the 2000s. And in media studies, we can say that the 2014 book, Media Technologies, is a shift, I'd say, it's, and it is a turn to infrastructure in media studies as well. I'd say that the Leah Libro's uh, chapter in that book is seminal for us to understand how cultural studies in communication has been uh, the most uh, salient in our field, but how uh, materiality is always there to be studied and what we had so far. And after that book, we have these other books from uh, Nicole uh, Isarozielski in uh, media, uh, critical media studies, and all of these other books, Paul Dorish uh, and also Raul Mukherjee that is emerging in the 2000, after 2010, after 2015. Uh, here, I'll just mention that we have two books uh, in the Global South, the Brian Larkin on Nigeria and Raul Mukherjee on India. We can also say that that our approach to code for a while, and 2006 was also an important moment when we had the, the term critical code studies emerging. After that, uh, we had with, um, with Mark Marino. After that, we have code as regulation uh, by Lars Lessig. And uh, all the books that come out after that also showing us that there are different, uh, different ways to look at code. But one thing I would like to call attention here is that we are now in a different wave to approach code. I think that after 2016, we have been, uh, it's difficult to discuss code without the social justice lenses. And that's something that we can notice in all these books uh, in, our, in the bottle here where class, race, gender has been approached uh, and uh, connected to code. One thing that I, I still miss, and I think it's a contribution uh, that I can bring as well, is the, the lenses of, uh, are the lenses from the global south. And I think we, can, we are going to see more and more uh, of that as we are approaching code. So what, uh, what is code? We can say that code uh, is a language and it's then a communication standard that connects coders, uh, devices, users, and the environment. And as a language, it necessarily has a grammar, the grammar of code that can be studied. And if we are going to follow Saussure, we can say that if we are studying one specific code, one specific language, we are also understanding more about what code is, meaning in studying one specific code, I can understand uh, if I am studying one specific internet protocol as BGP, that's my case, we can also understand more about uh, internet uh, protocols in general. Code is never uh, universal. And we can think about colonialism to understand that very quickly. 
Uh, universe, support of the universal, universal languages always bring with, with them power and hegemony, right? It's never neutral. And we can think about uh, no neutrality uh, in terms of design justice. Code also allows and uh, at the same time does not allow to do some things. It always renders some people and some things visible while others invisible. And that's why we can, it's okay if you say that code is biased, code is racist, as we have seen the literature so far. Uh, talking about code ethnography, uh, you necessarily are going to approach code as part of an assemblage. So code is always part of a network of relations. And if you think in terms of uh, actor network theory, uh, and also the Lewis and Gattari, we also we always we will see that as a network of humans and non-humans, including acts, emotions, etc. And this is important for us just to think about code as an artifact that needs to be understood in context. An important another important dimension of code is that it always uh, it always emerges from its materiality. So it may take some time for you to understand what is the material part of code, but uh, you should always uh, think that code is indissociable from its material part. Uh, so if there is, what are the physical elements that define the code that you are studying? Code is also an agent of change. And we see that by the language that NGOs uses, uh, use, for, for example, Let's translate human rights into code. Um, the fact is that it doesn't mean that uh, approaching just code, it will not be uh, constrained by the other actors in the assemblage. So it's not that uh, changing code, you are solving problems. We all uh, are trying to avoid any kind of technology determinism here. Code is political, as Laura Denardis and Galloway has uh, showed us. Uh, it's contingent. Uh, necessarily, it's a result of certain decisions, situated decisions, uh, and it is embedded in values. This is also an important uh, element for us to discuss because not necessarily uh, we know the values that are embedded into code, but we know that values are there. They are embedded in the grammar of the code, of code. And because of that, we should think that a code may be carrying such values to other contexts and other jurisdictions by design. Uh, code is also, uh, it shapes information. And here uh, we can think in terms of um, Duarte, Maria Elena Duarte, who, say, who says that information is like water. It takes the shape of the, uh, of the recipient. And I think if we think in this way, we will never dismiss the physical aspects of infrastructure. We will never dismiss what code is because it's also shaping information. And finally, code is subject to domestication. It's never, as any language, it can be changed and adapted while being used. So from that, we can say that a definition for one a kind of code ethnography that we can apply is uh, a code ethnography as a method to examine code as a social technical actor in consideration of its inherent social, political, and economic dynamics in digital infrastructure. And I apply code ethnography to internet interconnection infrastructure. So we all know that, uh, net, uh, that the internet is a network of networks, uh, but uh, in the communication, we have uh, overlooked this idea of uh, off, the off of the sentence. And this off is interconnection. Any uh, local network to be part of the larger internet needs to interconnect to another network. And that is a moment of uh, many negotiations and many events and controversies that may happen at that not only moment, but that also space. Interconnection, internet interconnection 
is always deeply connected with ideas of uh, uh, digital inclusion. That's how you need for you to have internet, you need to interconnect. That happens at your house when you have your, uh, your computer, you need to interconnect your computer to your internet service provider router. And the same happens with all internet service providers. They also need to interconnect among themselves. So internet uh, interconnection is deeply connect, is deeply related with uh, internet uh, access. And for us to understand interconnection, uh, there are two elements that uh, we need to pay attention on. One are the internet exchange points, which facilitate interconnection on our internet. They are critical uh, internet infrastructure that uh, we, they are not the only uh, way for doing interconnection, but they are key and uh, they have been uh, multiplied in the, in the recent years in the world. And also the code that allows that interconnection to happen is BGP, the Border Gateway Protocol. So this is the code we are going to, uh, to study here with code ethnography. So just a, a brief understanding of what inter, uh, internet exchange points are, this physical element of BGP. Uh, so when, our, when you are sending a message from your local network at your house, um, let's say an email, your internet service provider uh, needs to interconnect to the uh, content intermediary that you, are, that you are sending your email from. And they do that by connecting physically among each other. Uh, this may happen in any data center around uh, the world, and some of these facilities that help these interconnections to happen are inter internet exchange points. These are places where networks uh, meet, and they facilitate interconnection because as many networks come to the same place, uh, you, have, you, can you can just uh, define one session and then be connected to all networks at that place. It's a place, it's physical. Uh, for these networks to talk to each other, for your internet service provider at your house to talk to Google if you are using such uh, email uh, or, any other, or any other network, they need to speak to each other. Their networks have routers and these routers speak as my interview is saying. Um, and then for them to speak, they need a language, and this language is BGP. So this BGP is completely associated with what uh, internet exchange points are. Uh, just for you to have a sense, uh, these physical facilities that are IXPs, uh, we have more than 600 uh, in the, in the distributed in the world, uh, and they are uh, unequally distributed as we uh, could see uh, studying the data sets that are available online for us to see. The Global South has uh, less, uh, has fewer IXPs than the Global North and the development uh, have been uh, different, uh, different as well. So some methods considerations here uh, before we go and uh, understand uh, code ethnography applied to internet interconnection. My assumption then is that uh, power relations are material and can be studied uh, through code. My goal is to unveil power dynamics in internet interconnection infrastructure in which IXPs, internet exchange points and BGP are part of. And my standpoint is the global south. Code ethnography can be applied to any, uh, any interest uh, in relation to code. We can try to understand the ontology of code, what it is. We can try to understand the archaeology of code, uh, where it comes from. But in my case, I'm interested in understanding what code is doing, what BGP is producing right now in the relations between the global north and the global south. And for me to discover that, uh, uncover that, I do a kind of data collection that is based on symmetry. Necessarily, I need to uh, I create this uh, network uh, uh, field where I can study 
north and south together based on uh, BGP. So I do a field work for this study specifically on, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, that is where the, mo the biggest IXP in the, the, in the global south is, and Frankfurt, Germany, where the biggest IXP in the global north is. And again, my focus is the global south, and I have Frankfurt here, and the IXP is called the Kicks there. It's a commercial name. The Kicks is just a counterpoint for me to understand what is going on in the south. And my question is basically, is if, the, if BGP is the lingua franca uh, among network routers, the language used for internet networks to communicate, uh, what BGP has, uh, has what it is, is speaking or how routers are speaking uh, BGP? And is it different in the, U in the global north and the global south? Uh, just a quick uh, understanding about these two IXPs where I'm collecting uh, BGP. Uh, the IXBR in Brazil, uh, it was founded in 2004, while the Kicks in Frankfurt were, uh, was uh, founded almost 10 years before. And the traffic, uh, when this was collected, now these numbers are different after the pandemic. Uh, the traffic was uh, different because the Kicks uh, has much more traffic, had much more traffic than uh, than. Sao Paulo, the IXBR Sao Paulo. And one is for profit and another is uh, not for profit. This change uh, for, for researchers doing code ethnography, this changes the dynamics because the way that for profit institutions are going to receive you uh, is different than uh, when you are approaching not for profit institutions. So the access you can have to cert certain information is different. Uh, so let's talk about cold ethnography then in three ways. Uh, one is cold literacy. What do you need to understand about cold to conduct cold, uh, uh, ethnography of cold? Another is what is the cold assemblage that we can discover with cold ethnography? So I will explain to you what is the BGP assemblage that uh, arises from the application of cold ethnography. And, based, and at the end, I will tell you what code is saying, what is the materiality of code that we can see by applying code ethnography. So regarding uh, code literacy. Code literacy is not coding. You don't need to code to do code ethnography. And actually, when I, I say code literacy, I'm thinking of functional literacy. That is a concept that we bring from education and that I study for a while. When we talk about functional literacy, we understand that people do not grasp grammar, for example, to uh, speak, to communicate. Uh, the same with uh, code. We don't need to program code to know what we want to uh, understand about that code. But we need to understand what code can say. And for that, we can apply all, uh, all techniques that we have in social sciences to understand what, which questions can code answer. That is the key for code literacy. Once you understand your code, and one, once you understand what this code can answer to you, you are, you are approaching this code as an actor. So you are asking questions that they can respond. Uh, I, in, in, the, in my uh, immersion into, into BGP, I used participant observation. Uh, I necessarily had to, and this meant going to events in Frankfurt, going to events uh, in Sao Paulo to understand what are what the actors, the networks are talking about, uh, about BGP, about IXP, how do they communicate? I necessarily had to read lots of technical and legal documents for to grasp uh, what are the questions that are that are creating uh, the, the current environment about that code. Um, reading uh, necessarily technical um, 
articles and papers are also uh, important because even if the language that they use may start to be difficult for you to understand with all the formulas because of the questions they have, once you enter this world and understand what they are saying about the object that, that they are uh, part of, the, and I'm talking about computer scientists, I'm talking about uh, network engineers, once you understand their language, you can also understand what is at stake at that code. Even if that is, are not your questions, uh, it's important that, uh, uh, that we understand what uh, is there. Uh, also, public data sets were key uh, for me to understand better what BGP is. Uh, code collection is a, a, a moment when many people can find, scholars uh, may find uh, the moment to stop. Uh, your work because that's the moment when you are going to hear no, I can't give you this, uh, this data. Um, and I think that is the moment when you need to, in understanding code and understanding the code you are studying, you are going to create strategies to collect that. In the case of BGP, uh, I had to create proxies for that. So why are they not prefer profit institution in Brazil? Uh, would just send me the, the, the data and say, yeah, you can access that because our server, our server allows you to just do bank uh, download. Bakit doesn't necessarily uh, allow that. Their interface is different. So for that, I had to go into public, uh, public databases that collect such code for, uh, for research purpose. And then I had that access to code from, from the kicks. I had different sources to different kinds of, for the same kind of code. Uh, but then you need to understand what are the solutions for, for, for your, how can you access that code? Especially if, it, in my case, it is not privatized because BGP is public, but you are always going to try to, you are always going to, uh, you need to understand how that uh, is accessible for you. Uh, and we can discuss that more. Uh, for me to understand that in-depth interviews were key because in talking to uh, engineers, network engineers, you really, uh, you really grasp how you can access that code and what that code can answer you because you may have questions that the code can't answer. But I would also add uh, as an important uh, phase of literacy, code literacy, the ongoing conversations, because there are moments when you need to check with your interview with some of the information that you are collecting. And that is a moment when if you have that, uh, that relationship established, uh, you can have access to certain answers that the papers are not going to give you necessarily. Uh, once you have that code literacy, you can unveil the assemblage of code. And let's uh, be clear here that this assemblage is the, you are always situated in the assemblage. So the assemblage that you are going to uncover uh, is related to your interests. So my interest has been always the relation between the global south and the global north. And that's what I am, uh, I'm going to show you here. But before, I just want to share with you some uh, basic concepts of internet interconnection. So when networks are interconnecting to have the internet we have, uh, these networks are necessarily under uh, autonomous systems operators, uh, under organizations or under companies. And then they have the autonomous system numbers that are what BGP are going to map. So for a network to be part of the BGP uh, routing system, they need to have this number. It's a kind of ID. Uh, and under that numbers, we have networks. And under that numbers, we have computers. 
So computers are where our data packs are going to. There is, when we hear uh, the industry saying, oh, uh, would you like to use coal? Uh, would you like to use cloud computing? Uh, there is no cloud out there. It's always about computers. And uh, they, the, the structure of the internet is like that. We have corporations, we have corporations have autonomous systems that are identified with autonomous system numbers. Uh, they have networks under them and computers under them. So here you have the IXP, the Internet Exchange Point in the middle, helping all these autonomous systems interconnect to each other. So imagine that uh, we have three, four autonomous systems connected to this IXP. It's easy for them. They do one connection and they are connected to uh, AS1, 2, 3, and 4. If uh, AS4 wants to send data packets to AS5 uh, on your left, they can, they can select one of the paths here. One is, oh, I can send the data packets to the autonomous system one and it will reach autonomous uh, system five. Or it can uh, select autonomous system two that will send the data package to autonomous system six and then uh, equally arrive at autonomous system five. This is a very, a very a big simplification of how our data packets go from one point to another on the internet. And each of these uh, autonomous systems are taking decisions on where our data packet should go next. Uh, and that's how it will circulate. Our data packets are going to circulate. But for these interconnections to exist, they need to be, uh, there are negotiations and economic values around it. So there are two ways that networks interconnect among them, uh, via peering and via transit. Uh, talking about transit, transit is a, a customer uh, provider relationship. The same that you have at your house when you are hiring your internet service provider. So you pay for them to give access, to give you access to the internet. Internet service providers do the same. Uh, if they do not know how to reach certain addresses, if they do not have that connectivity, they need to pay someone to reach that, uh, that network that they are interested in. But if they have peering with other peers, with other networks, then their relationship is much uh, easier and commonly uh, neutral in terms of costs. So peering is commonly how internet, uh, internet service providers try to get access to other uh, networks and to increase their reachability. This uh, means that if they have the same size, internet service providers with the same size, they will try to do peering as much as they can. So they will increase their connectivity. And when they receive data packets in their network, they have a way to send that data packets with, with the lowest cost possible. It's all about money, say my interviewees. When they are doing peering, they are trying to reduce their costs to send data packets from one point to another. And who is regulating this? Where is this materialized? Uh, BGP. So this idea of these economic ideas are all in the grammar of BGP. When you see a script of BGP, you can see, for example, the customer provider relations on your right being, uh, being constructed. So these numbers that you see here in the last column, 3257, for example, this is the autonomous system that is connected to the IXP. And we have then all these other autonomous systems in the same line uh, that we can see that one is related to each other by economic relationship. I'll not explain you uh, in detail this script, although I can in the, in the uh, Q&A. But what I want you to see is that all that economic values, the commercial values uh, that these networks are sharing are embedded into the code. And the code here in the case is uh, border gateway protocol. 
What I want you also to understand is that the goal of any internet of any internet service provider is to have the biggest reachability that they can. So they will pay less to send data packets and to receive data packets uh, the same way. Um, this is all embedded in the code. Uh, and I hope you are following me because now I will show you a case that can explain to you this grammar even better. So um, very quickly, when I started to do this work in Brazil, I was looking at the IXPs there and what I would hear and read about IXPs is that all IXPs, these places, these physical places, uh, facilitate peering. They uh, allow to avoid the necessary international traffic, so they are great. They will keep local traffic local, so networks locally will interconnect at, in the country, and it will reduce latency, so the data packets will uh, go from one point to another on the internet in a way that it is not that uh, it, uh, it is fast. But I saw a noisy when I was there, uh, which was I, internet service providers in Brazil connecting to the IXP in Germany. And that was not something that you'd expect from the definitions that of IXPs that I, I was reading. So why? Why an internet service provider in Brazil would interconnect in Germany, if Brazil has more than 30 IXPs, these physical facilities for these uh, internet service providers to interconnect. That was the noise that I had to uncover and to understand. And for me to understand that one thing that appeared was first, all the content that uh, people in the Global South are accessing uh, are mostly um, in servers in the North. So first I discovered that qualitatively, but last, uh, last year uh, we also published with an economist some numbers for us to understand how uh, the, the global, global North concentrate lots of uh, the content that Global South is looking for. Here are just images for you to see uh, my field work. And then in studying code to understand why, why would that happen? Why Global South Internet Service Providers would send data packets from the South to the North? Uh, in understanding what the code could answer, what, how could I process this code with the help of, um, of um, engineers, network engineers, in this case, Thiago Gonçalves, who has helped me a lot. Uh, I then, looking at this code and what the code could say, uh, it was very clear that IXPs are not the same in the South and in the North. What BGP is saying uh, and how it is spoken in the South is different from the North. Necessarily, when an internet service provider, that one that attends you at your house, if they interconnect at an IXP in the north, they will have much more access to many more addresses than this would happen in the biggest uh, internet exchange point in the south. So this, uh, to, uh, this chart can show you the, the amount of difference. If an ISP connects in Frankfurt, it will have almost five times more uh, access to addresses then in the south, uh, if they access, uh, they interconnected only in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. So that's what internet service providers are looking for, more connectivity. And this is generating something that is not written, that the IXPs, this infrastructure, it's never, it's not just keeping local traffic local. Actually, the global north is attracting data from citizens from the global south because of the grammar of BGP and the economic values that are embedded into BGP. So it is different in Brazil that 96% of the, of the networks there are from Brazil, while in the, at the kicks in Frankfurt, 70% are international, only less than, uh, fewer than 30% of the networks there are from uh, Germany. 
Uh, so it's a difference between 30% and 96%. And uh, to finish also, it's important to see that this is uh, very clear how the global south, uh, there are more uh, networks from the global south in at the kicks than networks from the global north in Brazil. And when I ask uh, qualitatively for two people about uh, to network engineers about that, what that, does that mean for you that you are sending, uh, that you are just configuring, uh, configuring BGP and our data packets from the south are going to the north, including at Germany, that is a surveillance country, doing surveillance at, including at the IXC that I study here. Um, another case should be, uh, should be discussed. And then they would say, I asked, what about sovereignty? And they said, well, I understand you are talking about sovereignty in terms of states, but what about the sovereignty of the, the internet service providers? Because we are autonomous, we are autonomous systems. And uh, with that, I'd like to say, I read that as the, as the code and the physical infrastructure playing a role in the decisions of the internet service providers. Uh, it's, not all, it's not only about ideologies, you know, it's about how this materiality is playing a role. And we can study then code going from the material aspects of it, from the IXP to the data center, to the servers and routers to code, or we can do the other way around. We can start with code and go into to understand the devices that are produced because of that code, data centers that exist because of the way that code uh, runs, and then the administrative and governance uh, forums that exist because of code. So I hope you have been with me the whole presentation. Uh, I think that the more we include code uh, into digital infrastructure research, we are going to be able to unveil other layers of materiality and we open new directions to confirm or challenge narratives, uh, including uh, creating novel interpretations of the reality. And necessarily, the more I study code and the more I invite people to come to code, because this is just one uh, protocol and we have so many others to unveil, uh, to change imbalances of power in internet infrastructure, we may need to address how the code works. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Fernanda. Um, I don't know. Are we? Yes, we are. Okay, so I'm going to read some questions, but first I would like to ask, I would like to ask you, when you're, when you're talking about studying code, do you think which other, which other approaches can be used by studying code? Just, just as the way you are saying, like this is like a version of ethnography, and we have a follow-up question in the chat, but I was wondering, do you think so which other ways can we use or which other methods can we use in exploring code? Or shall we also use, you know, like computational methods for studying like code on this way or, or what, 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 what do you say about this? Oh no, you're muted. Oh, sure. No, thank you for the question. Um, Methods will also will always be selected based on, on who you are and your interests. Um, what I like about ethnography is that uh, it allows us to see uh, that, that event and that environment from below. And this helps us to, to in many ways, uh, the whiteness what these uh, spaces are, because you are listening and you are listening to people that you may not listen in other ways. Uh, in my case, using code ethnography, one thing studying BGP, one thing that I discovered, although I'm not approaching it here, uh, is how indigenous networks are necessarily uh, rendered invisible because of the way that uh, BGP uh, works and how it needs the ID 
to identify networks. And if network, indigenous networks do not have that ID, do not have the autonomous system number, then they will never be seen from above, right? Um, one thing that I would mention is, uh, depending on how you are going to approach code, uh, you may, if you want just a quantitative uh, approach, you can go into quantitative methods. But uh, the most important thing I think is for us to think is how code needs to be understood in context, because otherwise you'll never see this economic and the social political aspects that are around uh, code. Um, yeah, this would be <laughs> my answer. Thank you. Yeah, this is fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to read out loud the questions from uh, the public and I invite everyone, let me remind you that you can send your question here in the Q&A uh, in the button right here on Zoom. Okay, so apologies for saying wrong the names. Tomas Warna, he says, uh, I'm a grad student at MIT Comparative Media Studies. Thanks for this fascinating reflection on method. I'm wondering why you choose expression ethnography instead of close reading. Do you identify your approach with a broader genealogy of ethnography? What do you find specific about ethnography as a method in this context? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, I, when I started this study on internet interconnection, I was fascinated by ethnography of infrastructure as a method. So that's when I started to go into the physicality of the internet. I was interested in understanding uh, how infrastructure could be understood uh, through uh, ethnographic methods. So and that's for me different from uh, just close reading because it, it's an approach. It's an approach where you situate yourself first and you see in by that you see that environment from that perspective you can uh, clearly state what you are seeing comfortably because you are stating from the beginning from where you look you are looking at that in my case ethnography allows uh, me to talk about the relations between the global south and the global north from the perspective of the global south. And with that, I want to show how our understanding of uh, internet interconnection uh, is, is never really uh, showing the, the big picture because if we are always looking from the north, we are never going to see these inequalities that are embedded into code because of the grammar of code. So I would say um, this is why I use the, the term ethnography and of course the ethnography of infrastructure from Susan Starr and, and co-authors uh, have inspired uh, me a lot. Thank you. Okay, next question, which is um, also a comment. Professor, is Damilari Daniel says, Professor, do I need to understand mathematics and formula to understand coding? I have interest in coding, but my fear is mathematics. I studied and I am still studying communication. What do you have to say? <laughs> yeah, that's a great uh, question. Yeah, you don't need to uh, understand mathematics beyond your lenses from communication. Like your lenses is very valuable. You are going to situate what math is with your lenses. Uh, you don't need to code to understand the code you are interested in, uh, but you do need to have some curiosity to see how these others are talking about the code you are interested. I think when you open yourself to read how they are writing about the code that they are studying, uh, you really grasp more understanding, applying the frameworks that you have in communication. That's for me what is key. You, you, keep, you need to be very clear about who is your audience and your audience will still be communication scholars. Uh, so there is a space where it may become difficult because you may become too technical. Uh, and then your colleagues, they say, yeah, maybe you can be less technical here just for us to understand this better. Um, but again, and no coding is necessary and more communication scholars are necessary to understand code for sure. 
I agree. Okay, next question. Thank you so much. This is a question from Celeste Wagner. Thank you so much, Fernanda, for this thorough explanation on your approach to code ethnography. Based on your ethnographic research with different indigenous communities in Latin America, what do you think are the main ways in which we could transform how we access, use, and think of internet in everyday life? How can the internet be decolonialized? I'm reading here. Um, yeah, I think, uh, well, thank you so much, Celeste, for your question. Uh, Celeste is also someone with whom I dialogue uh, because of her work in Latin America. And yeah, there is something that um, we need to to understand and I think when we are studying code and we see who is just uh, how code is rendered some people uh, invisible we we need to start thinking from that position from that position so what that code means if we look from that position that is being invisibilized uh, and I don't know if I'm being clear here one thing is to look at this from code itself. The other thing is once you've noticed that something has been invisibilized, how you can position yourself in that space to understand how code looks like from that position. And that's when, for me, uh, I can say that BGP uh, ended up being a, a colonial language. Because if they are uh, in the if the way that they are they are written, uh, they facilitate centralizations of uh, flows of information going from the south to the north, and if they do not allow us to see dynamics that are still there because uh, they are there, and I could see when I was doing in, um, infrastructure uh, ethnography of infrastructure which is how indigenous people access to, uh, access the internet. So we have, uh, we need to rethink what this code is. So for me, the way for us to decolonize is always uh, being aware of where we are situated. And then once we notice the invisibility that has been uh, happening there, uh, we try to look at that same uh, object from that position. And I think that's the way that we can transform our understanding of what the internet is. Uh, of course, it's diff a difficult, uh, it's a challenge for me to talk about that at the level of interconnection, because we don't have that much understanding of interconnection as a community of communication scholars yet. So I'm doing, I'm trying to do both. Uh, once we understand what interconnection is and, uh, we will understand even more how this, this grammar of code is affecting our lives. So if you are going to study other kinds of code uh, and the code that you are studying are related, is related with areas that communication knows very well, I think it'll be even easier to uh, talk in terms of the colonization. But yeah, I'm talking about the colonization here and how the material form of the internet uh, is really uh, a colonial form uh, in our communication system. Oh God. <laughs> Next question says, hi, I'm Natalia from Chile. Thank you for the presentation. I have a question regarding field work. I imagine that tech companies, engineers, and the private sector in general are a difficult group to access to and work with. There were there were any challenges with uh, these groups and institutions during your field work? How did you manage to gain access uh, to do your research? Yeah, thank you very much, Natalia. Yes, it's very hard. And it, as, I, as I said, if we have uh, for-profit organizations, they sometimes may, um, may think that you are there to uh, survey them and not necessarily to do research, academic research. They also are very careful about the data that they have because this means competition and they may just say, no, I'm not shared such information uh, with anyone. 
Uh, in my case, I had the benefit of studying BGP. And BGP is a standard on the internet. And as you understand the code, you know that there are public databases that you can access because certain actors are collecting such data for research purpose. So in my case, when I was talking with not-for-profits, it was easier because they had that openness to say, yeah, please do your research and let us know what you discover. While with for profit, I had more difficulty in getting such data. And then I had to circumvent that going into institutions that also work for with education uh, purpose. When I was reaching out to uh, companies as GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Meta, and um, Amazon, uh, yeah, you may face, you may receive some notes on the way, and then you need to try to reach other people and see how it goes. Okay, we have uh, one comment and I think a final question. Uh, comment says, Lefali, um, I don't have any question for now, but I would like to thank Professor Fernanda for her informative speech from Turkey. And I think we have a, a final question from Professor Pablo. Hi, Fernanda. Thank you very much for a fascinating um, talk. I was wondering, since you mentioned the edited collection with the chapter of Lea Libro uh, in it, you know, media technologies, if uh, during your fieldwork there were any instances of uh, repair, right, which is a very germane field to study essentially the politics of infrastructure, because when things break down is when we can observe, but particular aspects of materiality that might be less visible um, in uh, normal functioning. And then referring to Steve Jackson's uh, chapter on, you know, broken world thinking and, you know, how to think about repair. So I wonder whether in either of the two settings or in both, and if you saw um, what that revealed uh, related to issues of coloniality. Yeah, thank you for the for the question. Uh, yeah, I think repair is always there uh, as an issue, as an in an in a necessity. Um, there are for there are, for example, uh, real real um, talks about that in comparing DKIX and IXBR because IXBR sometimes is out. <laughs> And it is a not-for-profit, but also the cost of it for for people are much uh, is much much lower than it is in Europe or in the U.S. So the problem is that in the global south, uh, internet service providers use IXPs in the way that is not necessarily how the technical people ask uh, them to use, meaning that. IXP should be your second way of connecting to the larger internet. You, all, you should, should always have redundance when you are connecting to the larger internet. But in the global south, in Brazil specifically, we have more than 7,000, actually much more than that now, uh, internet service providers with a huge number. This is not comparable with any other country we know. Um, so the fact that we have very small internet service providers, they are spending low, the lowest money they can. So they use IXP in this way. When it goes down, the internet may go down uh, where they are serving because they do not have redundance. Uh, so repair is always a, a key question when we are talking about this. And that's why we have, uh, we have redundance all the time and networks are always trying to connect uh, two routers uh, to allow them to have a second way to go uh, uh, every time. But I'd also mention very quickly that this repair appears a lot in the indigenous uh, networks that I study as well, and that are not uh, visible through BGP um, because they need, as they buy uh, cheap equipment, uh, if there is some problem with the weather, they necessarily have problems with the equipment. Thank you very much. We are perfectly uh, on time, actually. Uh, so thank you again, Fernanda, for a fabulous presentation. Very, very 
Enlightening. Thank you, Mariana, for, as always, great moderation. Thank you to our audience for staying with us uh, through the end. And I invite uh, everybody to join us next Thursday for a presentation by Maria Elena Cepeda, Williams College, in the virtual seminar series of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you again. Thank you.